Thank you. Uh, I should make a note at the beginning that um, in the wake, that prepositional phrase uh, might disappoint some people who think that I will be speaking a lot about Don or Bergson because um, I'm mainly talking about Kurt Gerg, uh, who came after uh, that trinity, so to speak. Um, that being said, perhaps more than at any historical epoch, the 20th century witnessed radical tectonic shifts in the way time was represented in the arts, the sciences, and philosophy. This is almost a commonplace these days, particularly in the wake of Einstein's revolutionary revision of temporality in physics. Early 20th, early 20th century artists often represented time with scientific perspectives, particularly physical ones, firmly in mind. Of course, it was Einstein's 1905 publication of his special theory of relativity during his Annus Mirabilis, which is generally cited as the most prominent of these. Although, as Michael Whitworth suggests in Einstein's Wake, and as Stephen Kern argues in The Culture of Time and Space from 1880 to 1912, we should not neglect the influence of rapidly evolving communications and transportation technologies, which altered, and I might suggest disfigured, the way modern human beings represent and experience time. But despite these cultural factors, Einstein's revision of time and his theorization of simultaneity remains the most important for 20th century philosophy and literature. Certainly there were myriad influences, especially the contrasting thought of Henri Bergson and the complementary serialism of J.W. Dunn's experiment with time. Bergson's meeting with Einstein on April 6, 1922 at the Société Française de Philosophie in Paris remains an under-discussed benchmark in the history of the study of time. One exception is Jimena Canales' um, article, which refers to it as uh, the experiment that failed. Uh, it, was no, it was a notoriously heated uh, argument between the two. According to Bergson's account, the two men couldn't agree on a single thing, <laughs> neither political or scientific. This might lead us to conclude that their philosophies were incompatible absolutely, that Einstein's simultaneous cosmic vision did not accord with Bergson's notion of duration and its intrinsic relationship with human memory. It was also billed as a conflict between rationality and intuition. It's been cited as the origin of what was called, at least in the United States, the Science Wars by Alan Sokol and Jean Brickmont, uh, based upon a similar notion that this was a battle between rationality and imagination, or experience, that is. However, upon closer inspection, they can be made to cohere if only at what Firendi called different levels of, of, of abstraction. There was, of course, another philosophy who emerged at the same time, the one that I'll talk about tangentially, and this is Dunn's, um, a fascinating if somewhat speculative work um, that was in its heyday remarkably popular and remains a touchstone in contemporary philosophy. Uh, most of us, I think, are probably familiar with it, um, but what's often forgotten is that Dunn's conclusions are remarkably similar to Einstein's, although the method through which he reached these conclusions is drastically different. Einstein's vision, at least on the surface, however, allows for only one modality of time, a Spinozan vision raised to a cosmic exponent. Neither Bergson nor Dunn has attracted much attention from scientists, however, nor gained much momentum as we navigate the early 20th, 21st century. Yet the importance of Einstein among modernists has become something of a critical commonplace, and the tendency to attribute a unidirectional relationship between science and art and especially literature, that is, literature drawing from science rather than um, in an almost parasitic manner, rather than some sort of a, a rapport between the two. Such a tendency is evident in Alan J. Friedman and Carol Donnelly's Einstein as Myth and Muse, a useful work to be sure, but one that tends to point to Einstein as an isolated Olympian. Rather than this one-way interchange, I suggest a symbiotic relationship, or perhaps, as I, I would put it the other way around, with science sometimes formulating what art has already largely surmised in advance. This is the general theme rather than the thesis of my argument, but one that I'd like you to keep in mind. Art occupies a vanguard in the world of ideas through intuition and imagination, while science usually follows with more particular methods, something like the maxim that where the heart leads, the head will follow. There is, of course, a complex dialectic at work here, and this trend is not absolute, 
But the point is that ideas about reality from the arts and sciences are largely convergent. Despite claims of the contrary, such as C.P. Snow's much abused notion of the two cultures. I would like to investigate the possibility of one such instance in modern representations of temporality. Modernist, I should say, to be more specific. In 1939, the mathematician Kurt Gödel, best known for his incompleteness theorems, formulated a corollary to Einsteinian relativity via mathematics, which have actually yet to be disproved, that posited a complementary but quite different relativistic vision of time in the spirit of Einstein. In short, he conceded that the universe might be infinite in dimensions, but that it was rotating. Second, he demonstrated that given such a space-time manifold, it was possible to travel forward at speeds exceeding light, light speed, and return to a previous moment in space-time, quite literally. Third, one consequence is what physicists such as Michael Lockwood have called a block universe, one where all events exist simultaneously in the space-time manifold. Now, even though there are many intriguing tangents here, many, I don't want to explore the notions of time travel or the, the eternal return, although those are obviously quite interesting. What I will do is compare this Gerdelian philosophy of time, one that has been little discussed in literary theories, with representations of time in modernist literature, particularly uh, in Kafka and Joyce. We'll look at Kafka's Das Schloss and uh, Joyce's Ulysses and Finnegan's Wake, albeit briefly in both instances, pointing out the, ten the tension between traditional and relativistic perspectives of time manifest in these works. Each author demonstrates that Einsteinian relativity was a scientific idea that obviously exerted a profound effect on the literary climate of the early 20th century, a fact that has been variously noted. However, my paper is the first to argue that these authors reached a version of Einsteinian relativity, relativity strikingly similar to Gödel's 1939 corollary to Einstein's special and general theories, one that he published in a full version, an expanded version, in 1950 in the Proceedings of the International Congress of Mathematicians, and an even more refined version entitled Rotating Universes in General Relativity Theory in 1951. This has been incorporated by Douglas Hofstetter, a uh, cognitive scientist, into a fusion of Gödel's incompleteness theorem in a well-known work, Gödel Escher Bach, An Eternal Golden Braid, which describes such structures and calls them strange loops, a term which I will recourse to occasionally. So first, to Kafka. The relationship between Kafka and Gödel is an interesting one, and one that has uh, yet to be fully explored. They both grew up in the decaying Austria-Hungary that would sow the seeds for the golden autumn in Vienna, which saw the emergence of Freud, Wittgenstein, Karl Popper, Robert Musil, etc., etc. But their visions of time have much in common, and not necessarily because of some sort of notion of a zeitgeist or anything like that. I'm not suggesting that. For this reason, it is no surprise that in a memoriam published in the Mathematician's Intelligencer upon Gödel's death, he was described as, literally, the union of Einstein and Kafka. Let us examine briefly time, in this sense, in Kafka's Das Schloss. Kafka erects a particularly Gerdelian reality in the novel. The, con the connection between these two men, as I just mentioned, has been made before. And in part, this affinity between the two thinkers resides in Gödel's insistence that formal systems necessarily fall apart because even axiomatic ones must rely on an infinite regress of proofs to sustain themselves. And this is exactly the same mode of logic that he uses to build his um, metaphysics of time. As Rudy Rucker notes, a, uh, he's a science fiction writer but also a philosopher, um, the Kafkaesque aspects of Gödel's work and character is expressed in his famous incompleteness theorems of the 1930s, but also explicitly in his work on time. Just as systems can never be fully complete for Gödel, Neither can they achieve either stasis or finitude for Kafka. There is, of course, a strange logic at play also throughout the castle. Normal perceptions are regularly or irregularly inverted until readers are, like K, quite lost in the novel's temporal contortions and digressions. It is pertinent that K travels, and I quote, in circles and loops of revision and consolidation rather than in any linear or evolutionary path of progression. 
Instead of the reason of formal logic, the text is riddled with nonlinearities. Another persistently strange inversion of logic throughout the novel is Kafka's contortion of space-time. Space-time in the castle is more like Escher's drawing ascending and descending than one might notice at first glance. For one, it is a warped space where movement seems to defy common sense perception. When Kay dispatches Barnabas back to the castle, for example, he is astonished to see just how quickly the messenger has traversed an otherwise impossible distance and amount of time. Kafka seems to suggest that space and time in the novel do not obey the linear logic of normal reality, and this strangeness becomes even more apparent when Kay, heading toward, the, toward another inn at one point in the middle of the novel, does not feel as if he and his guide Barnabas have gotten anywhere, even though they clearly have. Again, Escher's ascending and descending, if you're familiar with it, provides a valuable analog here. There is actual progress, and yet there is an illusion of progress, an illusion of motion. Kay and the novel's readers are trapped in a regress of an impossible Penrose staircase. In Kafka and his precursors, Jorge Luis Borges equates the castle with Zeno's paradox, which would seem quite likely and has been, been done widely. An important comparison tying these strange loops that are common in Gödel's philosophy of time with Kafka's novel and the paradoxical space-time that so perplexed the Eleatic philosophers. Zeno's paradox is implicit in the castle insofar as within its fictional micro-world, motion is impossible. As Glicksburg has noted, as in the fiction of Samuel Beckett, there is no forward motion in Kafka's work, no logical plot in the traditional linear sense. Kafka's characters are, like Zeno's Achilles and the tortoise, unable to achieve any movement towards any goal, a similar scenario that one would find in an Einsteinian block universe. That is, they are trapped in a paradoxical loop. As Borges notes, the, movement, the moving body and the arrow and Achilles are the first Kafkaesque characters in literature. Indeed, the Penrose staircase is an apt analogy here for the entire novel, and its various settings reflect similar contorted spaces. For example, when Kay enters the, the inn to meet with the bureaucrat Erlanger, this twisted space-time is more like a labyrinth underground than a normal inn. No angle anywhere, of course, either in space or time, seems to meet at 90 degrees in any work by Kafka. The maze-like strange loop structure even prevents Kay from finding the room where he is to meet her longer, after what seems like an imponderable wait, even though he has only been in his predicament for a matter of days, but time has somehow been dilated in the Einsteinian sense. In other words, he is in a strange hall of mirrors, a fractalic space-time of non-Euclidean geometry, similar to that which dominates Finnegan's Wake, a type of space that becomes especially prominent in later postmodernist works. Just as we are sure never where we are, we also are never sure when we are in Kafka's novel. The historical period, for one, is indeterminate. Despite the seemingly medieval flavor of the text, there is a telephone to which Kay reacts as if it were either out of place or completely alien to him. This temporal uncertainty also is reflected in the novel's spatial indeterminacy and lapses in time that are as warped as those in space. From the novel's outset, time passes in an, also, in an almost hypnagogic manner, suspended between waking daylight and the dream of night. There are no objective metrics by which to mark its passing, because as in Einstein's theory and in Gödel's interpretation of that theory, there are no absolute frames of reference. It seems as if Kay is trapped within the castle's labyrinth for an extended period of time, but if one actually counts the passages of day and night in the text, he is only there for six days, which is remarkable. This indeterminate time span has been discussed, but it is the indeterminacy that is important. We are never sure in a strange loop, such as Gödel describes, exactly where in the temporal hierarchy we are. Likewise, when Kay asks uh, Pepe the barmaid about the arrival of spring, amongst other questions about time, she never delivers a straight answer. He is trapped in a temporal limbo, where liminal space is something like a metamorphosis between what is determinate and what is indeterminate. Time fluctuates in part because Kafka's plot, or lack thereof, does not require much attention to it. True to the novel's psychological nature, time seems to be more like a mind-dependent Kantian concept than an independent and absolute Newtonian reality. Appropriately for a post-Einsteinian fiction, both space and time are warped because they are two sides of the same 
Merbius strip, if you will. This comparison with Einstein draws me to two points about the relationship between Kafka's novel and the science of time more broadly. First, time as expressed in Das Schloss reflects Einsteinian space-time to a startling degree, as, we, as I've suggested. Second, the novel's bureaucratic tangled hierarchy represents on some level the epistemological problems of science as a social practice rooted in language, including that universal language, mathematics. As Rucker has noted, scientists are thus left in a position somewhat like Kay in the castle. Endlessly we hurry up and down corridors to meet people, knock on doors, conduct our investigations, but ultimately the success will never be ours. Nowhere in the castle of science is there a final exit to absolute truth. This reflects a pauperian or even pragmatist vision of science as an endeavor that can only ever refine its knowledge, its quest ever incomplete. As Catherine Hales notes of this aspect, if science approaches truth, it does so asymptotically, coming incrementally near but never quite arriving. This parallels Kay's dilemma in the castle quite nicely. Indeed, Rucker points out that the only way to solve such double binds is to step outside the system, something that Douglas Hofstetter has called jutsing, jumping outside of the system. Because to understand the essentially labyrinthine nature of the castle is somehow to be free of it. And this applies to Gerdelian space-time insofar as in order to get the grand picture, one must attempt to envision oneself outside of it. Now to Joyce. Joyce's representations of time, I think, are significantly more complex uh, than Kafka's. Um, if the strange loops in Ulysses and the Wakes are spiraling outward to encompass the totality of existence within their encyclopedic swoop, then in some ways his uh, project is antithetical to Kafka's, who's is always winding inexorably inward in search of a center that does not seem to exist at all. Scholarship on the interdiscursive inter relationship between physics and Joyce's work is legion, but there has been little discussion of how his metaphysics physics of time compares with technical scientific interpretations of Einstein, tending to treat with popularizations of these ideas instead. Another tendency has been to see the presence of Vico and Bergson as overshadowing any effect of Einstein's in Joyce's work. A few years ago at um, MLA in, C in Seattle, uh, Enda Duffy gave a, a marvelous paper on um, the presence of Bergson in Joyce. And after the talk, he and I had a brief discussion um, about this disagreement with, between Bergson and Einstein, and uh, I asked him if, if that complicated uh, uh, Joyce's use of Bergson in any way. And so, in some ways, this is the this is the outcropping of of that that discussion. Um, the notion that perhaps they were instead of formulating theories at different levels, that they were perhaps um, not mutually exclusive at all, uh, as they themselves believed. Um, Joyce's own philosophy of time has been thoroughly discussed by critics, but the tendency has been to categorize him discreetly in almost Linnaean fashion as an Augustinian, a Bergsonian, or an Einsteinian, although the latter more rarely. But our man Joyce is the quintessential literary chimera. And on the topic of time, dare I say the only topic that we literally cannot escape, Joyce remains a hybrid. In this sense, I believe, and hopefully can muster some evidence to support this, that Joyce imbues his work with several theories simultaneously in the same way that Gödel does, rendering time as both a simultaneity, a la Einstein and Dunn, or if you will, also Parmenides, uh, and also as flux, a la Heraclitus, embodied in his well-known axiom Pantarei, or everything flows. Uh, Einsteinian relativity, in this sense, is also a perfect complement to the perspective of Spinoza's God, uh, which was one subspecie aeternatus, a notion Einstein often cited and which appears several times in both Ulysses and Finnegan's Wake. Uh, Leopold Bloom even has a copy of uh, Spinoza on his bookshelf, albeit a book that does not actually exist. Uh, the tension between Einsteinian simultaneity and this notion of flux uh, arises in the Proteus chapter in Ulysses. As Stephen Dedalus states, I am astride at a time, a very short space of time through very short times of space. Stephen's self therefore constructs itself in a thoroughly Einsteinian reality, and one might even say a Gerdelian one, where time is nonlinear and loop-like, especially if one considers the closed time-like curves that are fundamental to Gödel's theory. Consequently, Stephen crosses not only the ostensible rift between subject and object, 
but also that rift between Newtonian and Einsteinian perspectives, looping between different configurations of space-time simultaneously. On one level, a strange loop requires linear sequential motion in order to move in order for a movement between hierarchical levels to occur diachronically. And on another level, when an observer steps outside the system, this is jutsing again, jumping outside the system, he or she sees it as an organizationally permanent structure. Strange loops, in Gödel's sense, operate in both modes, depending on the level of the observer. Yet despite Stevens' frequent musings on nonlinear time in Ulysses, the novel's macrostructure remains somewhat linear following the clock with an almost obsessive precision. Joyce does not depict genuine temporal nonlinearity until the wake. Nevertheless, throughout Proteus, Joyce entertains the possibility that time, like space, is indeed a nonlinear recursive feedback loop, or you could say a Gerdelian space-time manifold. Various types of strange loops abound also in Bennigan's Wake. The most obvious suggestion of this Geometry is, of course, the, no the novel's formal circularity. Joyce expands the spatial nonlinearity of Ulysses and Stephen's musings in the early portions of that novel into a full-blown metaphysics of nonlinear time in the wake. These spirals resemble the grand historical cycles of Vico's New Science, as well as Yeats's Gyres. They are also the recursive spirals that characterize Gerdelian space-time. Immediately, readers notice that the novel begins halfway throughout its final sentence or conversely ends halfway through its first. As it opens, river run past Eve and Adams, from swerve of shore to bend of bay, brings us by a commodious vicus of recirculation back to Hoth Castle and environs. This commodious vicus of recirculation, of course, takes us in a manner characteristic of a strange loop and also a Viconian cycle across the entire tome right back to the beginning. Away, alone, a last, a love, along the. In strictly formal terms, the text is certainly a Gerdelian loop, having passed through various bizarre inversions only to find itself back at its point of departure. As a legion of critics have noted, such circularity pervades the wake, and Joyce makes no secret that his work is, as he says, psychological. As with Ulysses, the text constantly evokes the looping cyclicality of the Book of Kells, weeping with words what the monks wrought in ink, and they leap so looply, looply as they link to light, and they look, they look so lovely, louvelet, noosed in a nuptious night. Indeed, although the emphatic use of loop here is coincidental, and loop, I should mention, is repeatedly used by Gödel. It's one of his fundamental, um, fundamental concepts. Uh, this line is an apt description of the strange loops that pervade the wake as well. Cycles of day and night, life and death, waking and dreaming come for choice, both the stuff of history and of the mind. He also, not, he also oscillates around repeating patterns that never quite stabilize themselves in this same sense. Indeed, this metastability produces a pattern that was cyclum cyclorums after he made design on the course again and agone and all over again, constantly reborn in the very process of its recreation. This produces frustrating yet whimsical paradoxes because Joyce's text moves in vicious circles and, as he says, remues the same. There is, again, both stasis and flux. There is a similar instance in the Dolph and Kev section in the wake. As, this, as uh, Kev states, the unitate we have in one, or hence shall have, the victorious ready eyes of ever two circumflex rent circlers never film in the ellipsities of their gyrabouts those fickers which are eternally repredictive of themselves. Here is a clear example of a strange loop in both the cyclical and recursive sense, replete with gyrabouts <coughs> and ellipsities, suggestive of gyres, ellipses, and other circular imagery, but also of loops, and specifically temporal ones. But again, these patterns are not merely circular because they are eternally rep reproductive of themselves. They are indeed recursive. Thus, in both novels, we seem to have a perspective of time that is both something like ice and water that coexist at a critical triple point, a solid block universe and a fluid river of time rolled into one. This accords with Gödel's formulation, a universe fully coherent with Einstein, but not dismissive of the notions of Bergson either. 
An interesting tangent, just briefly worth noting here, is that both Joyce and Gödel were uh, obsessed with metempsychosis. Um, and I, it, this would be a different paper, but it, it may, I, I'm starting to think that it's possibly an offshoot of Gödel's Metaphysics of Time, um, his fascination with it. But it, that's quite an interesting coincidence that their temporal schemas are so similar, and yet that theme um, obsessed both of them. We therefore have, in both Kafka and Joyce's work, a remarkable convergence, as I suggested at the beginning of this talk, between artistic representations and scientific ones. I am not equating these views, nor saying that they are perfect analogs. Rather, they point to a sort of da Vinci effect on a grand scale, a union of art and science, despite drastically different methodologies. Let me conclude with a speculation based on this argument, one that I think uh, those bibliophiles among us, who I am assuming is everyone, um, will certainly appreciate. Consider the book itself as an artifact. Here we have an excellent analogy for the temporal schema, this Gerdelian schema, which I am suggesting. The book exists as a simultaneity in space-time, insofar as a text is all there at once, a fictional block universe. If we have already read the text, then it also exists as both the whole physical artifact on the shelf on one level, as the cognized text on the other, realized for us already in its entirety, and thus resembling a Gerdelian block universe where all events are coeval and, in some sense, eternal. Yet on another level, the text is, of course, never actualized except as a, in, through the linear modes of cognitive apprehension, as what Umberto Eco used to call a linear text form. Uh, that, it is ha that is, it has to be read. In this sense, it can only be realized in a different sort of time through sequential linguistic processing. This is more akin to Bergson's philosophy, but also points to Gödel in another sense. Texts are eternally reread. Thus, as in a Gerdelian universe, we inevitably proceed through a text only to end up precisely where we began in perfect harmony with this notion of a fluctuating simultaneity. So we have two levels of abstraction here. And, and I'm ignoring several meta levels, such as um, nested temporalities or the possibility that we ourselves are somehow being read or you know, some of these more um, bizarre metaphysical speculations, which are Fantastic and great, but um, <laughs> a character like ourselves, uh, as like ourselves as physical organic beings, exists in two modalities. One, their fictional lives are always already lived out by virtue of the fact that they're always already written. Just as in Einstein's and Gödel's schema, we are living out events that have, in a very real sense, already occurred and will perpetually occur until the end of time, forever and ever. Amen. But these characters are not truly come to life, as Shaw might say, until we render them alive in our mental theater. In this sense, they are bound to a different sort of time, a human time, one that is lived and that grinds inexorably forward, if not for the saving grace of memory. Joyce and Kafka, of course, are but two examples of this. One can see these tendencies in Wolf, uh, Faulkner, particularly at, um, As I Lay Dying, but there's quite a bit of that in, in in there as well, uh, Eliot's Four Quartets. Uh, if we wanted to complete the so-called modernist trinity, we could probably throw Proust in there. Um, in all cases, one thing is clear. No single system of temporality will suffice. Under every empirical test to which it has been put, Einstein's theory has survived, and if anything, grown, and if, and if anything has grown more robust. But our own intrinsic phenomenological experience, our, our lived experience, tells us that time flows even if memory allows us to shunt from past to specious present. We exist in what can only be called a para paradox, as we so often find ourselves, something that Gödel would, of course, been apt to admit. We inhabit a world governed by physics, acting out events already written, as such our victories, defeats, joys, and miseries are thus eternal without the need for any logical skyhooks. This is a miracle of reality, a wondrous way to see the universe as a multifaceted jewel, much as, if you'll forgive a popular culture reference, Dr. Manhattan does in Alan Moore's Watchmen. At the same time, we inhabit a continuum, unable to access the echoes of our past or the pings of our future. This is the human condition at its rawest, a Miltonic woe at lost time, a memento mori so frustratingly inevitable that, as Dr. Johnson so elegantly put it, all of life is but the forgetting of it.
In this sense, I think Wyndham Lewis was somewhat misguided when he accused his contemporaries, and particularly Joyce, of sponsoring a time cult which he saw as a symptom of his era. I would say, what else is there? Einstein writes in The World as I See It that the most beautiful experience we can have is the mysterious. It is the fundamental emotion that stands at the cradle of true art and true science. Whoever does not know it and can no longer wonder, no longer marvel, is as good as dead, and his eyes are dimmed. Only when seen from both perspectives, time as simultaneity and as flux, as Gödel renders Einstein, can these two voices in the fugue of life be heard in their beautiful, wretched, ecstatic complexity, a choir of order in chaos, a dirge that is also a symphony in a cosmic key. And through literary experience and its symbiosis with science, we can learn to hear this siren song a little clearer. Pick up the grace notes in the music of the spheres, which is why we perhaps come back to literature time after.